What's up everyone? I'm Sunny with the Be Kind Crew and I want to welcome you to Connect to STEM TV. Organized by the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix, in partnership with Cox Communications and the Arizona SciTech Festival. That's right, you're about to enter the wonderful world of STEM and have fun with your very own project. Are you ready? Let's go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Connect to STEM Live. Who's ready to scrub in and join us for Saturday Scrubs? Please meet our team. Hi there, it's nice to meet all of you guys. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. We'll go do some brief introductions. Okay, well, I hope you guys are all having a good morning so far. Um, thanks for joining us. We're the University of Arizona College of Medicine Phoenix Student Health Outreach Team. And today we're gonna to present to you a journey through medicine. So we're gonna go from high school to becoming a physician, what that entails. Some quick intros. This is our team. My name is Megna J. Raman. I'll let the other two or three introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Isabel Strauss and along with Megna and Trevor, I'm also one of the leaders of the Student Health Outreach Team. Hi, my name is Trevor Smith and I'm also the leader of the Student Health Outreach Team. And my name is Chip Young and I'm the coordinator of Pipeline Initiatives. So I work with our medical students with Saturday Scrubs and Summer Scrubs. Thank you guys. So we're gonna move on with our presentation. We're gonna start out with the journey to medical school. So that's what I'm gonna be talking off, starting off talking about and then I'll switch over to Trevor in about 15 minutes. Um, so to start off, we're gonna go over the ins and outs of your pre-med years and what to expect, what to plan for, et cetera. So a little bit about myself to start out with. Uh, my name is Magna Jaraman, as I mentioned before. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. I went to high school in Chandler. I graduated from Basha High School in 2015, then went to college in Tucson, graduated from the University of Arizona in Tucson in 2019. I majored in biomedical engineering, and I minored in astronomy and math. Then between college and medical school, I took a gap year. During this gap year, I worked at a small startup pharmaceutical company in Tucson, and of course, canceled most of my travel plans thanks to COVID, but here's a picture of me in New York before, in the November before um, everything shut down. And then finally, now I'm currently in medical school. I started at University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix in 2020, and I'm very excited to be here and very excited to give you guys this presentation today. So to start off, we're going to go over a general timeline. Um, so we're going to talk about high school. We're going to talk about college, um, gap years or years, depending on how many you guys take. Um, or if you choose not to take any, and then the application process as well. So as you guys know, high school is about four years, college four to five years, depending on what your major is, um, what you decide to do, and then your application cycle generally takes about a year. So um, to make this a bit more interactive, we're gonna play a little game. If the journey to medicine was a four course meal, what do you guys think high school would be? You guys are free to put it in the chat, but no pressure. Awesome, so I see some appetizers. That's what I was thinking too. So I like to compare it to a little charcuterie board. High school is a time to sample everything on your plate in order to figure out what you really like and what flavors pair well together. So getting into that a little bit more, um, what to consider in high school. I think here are the four most important things to consider in high school from our perspectives. One is to get involved in the community. Uh, medicine's a really service and communication oriented field, so it's important to get out there, get engaged with your community, and feel comfortable striking up conversations and interacting with the community. Um, an example of this is to try volunteering at your local hospital. That's always good. Um, you can also um, engage in some shadowing activities, and what shadowing means is you reach out to lo local doctors and see if they'll let you shadow them or essentially follow them around their practice for a day or two days. Um, what this allows is for you to see if medicine is something you're actually really interested in and something you want to pursue. Next up, make sure you get to know yourself. High school is one of the only times that you can really, I mean, college, of course, but high school is when you get to really focus on what interests you. You get to think about what sort of majors you might find interesting. And of course, what's most important is focusing on picking a college that's a good fit for you, um, that meets your needs in terms of clubs and city and all of the above. 
Um, and most importantly, make sure to relax because I know this might seem sort of stressful right now, but very little of what you do in high school will even appear in your medical school application. I don't mean that in a stressful way. I mean that in a way of take some pressure off your shoulders. Um, instead, use this time to focus on what you're actually passionate about and grow those interests because that's what will appear even more powerfully in four years. And most importantly, have fun. So now college. If the journey to medicine was a four course meal, what do you guys think college would be? No pressure if you guys don't know. Um, I like to think of it as a salad. So college can be about as, jam as simple or as jam packed as you like, but it's time to apply some of those flavor combinations that you picked out from high school. And remember that there's no right way to make a salad. So diving more into college, um, when it comes to choosing a major, it's important to pick something that you're genuinely interested in. What I mean by that is you will be eating, sleeping, and breathing this major for the next four years. So it's important to pick something that you actually like instead of picking something that you think will look good on an application because that's not the point of it. Um, some traditional pre-med majors are generally STEM subjects such as biology, chemistry, biochemistry, and physiology. But what I'd like to stress is don't be afraid to break out or branch out it's really important. Pick something you like, pick something that you think will be worthwhile for four years. And medical schools at the end of the day also like to cultivate a class with diverse perspectives. So my class at the University of Arizona College of Medicine has history majors, art majors, and dance majors, not just STEM majors. So it's really important to have that sort of diverse perspective because that's what you want in your workforce of doctors one day. But with that being said, it is important to take some prerequisite courses in order to get into medical school. So although you can pick whichever major you want to, it's important to take these specific courses and they do vary a little bit depending on what medical school you're trying to apply to. But in general, um, and this aligns sort of with the University of Arizona's prerequisite courses, it's important to take general chemistry about two semesters with labs, organic chemistry, one to two semesters with labs, biology, two semesters with labs, physics, one to two semesters with labs, math, one semester of any general math that they offer, and, in, and then generally uh, med schools like to see one semester of statistics or biostatistics, one semester of physiology with lab, one to two semesters of English, and then about one semester of biochemistry. But like I said, the reason why there's a lot of variance in this is because certain med schools like different prerequisites, so it's important to keep that in mind when you get into college. And one more thing I'd like to note is it's important to check and see if AP credits count at the medical school you're interested in. I'm sure a lot of you guys are high achieving students and taking AP, IB credits, whatnot. Um, it's important to remember that sometimes these may not roll over into medical school to cover these prerequisites. So I know I personally had to retake a lot of these courses, even though I take an AP classes for them. Now getting into extracurriculars in college. I like to think that the three main categories of extracurriculars are clinical experience, volunteer experience, and research experience. So I have a little list of do's and don'ts for you guys with regards to picking extracurriculars. One, it's important to pick specific experiences that you guys feel passionate about. Don't pick experiences just to check off a box on a list. That's not, not the point of it. Two, in order to do this, it's important to pick a select few extracurriculars that you guys actually enjoy and care about. Because if you just overload yourself with extracurriculars until you're overwhelmed and unhappy, that's doing yourself a disservice. And um, just in general, even the club you're doing, you're doing it a disservice, you know? Because what you'd like to do is contribute 110% of your efforts to three to five activities that you really love, maybe even try to hold leadership positions, instead of contributing 50% of 10 activities just because you're so spread out then, you know? Um, also be able to discuss in depth what you gained and contributed to each experience. I can't stress this enough. Med schools love to hear why this experience was memorable to you and why it was important to you. So make sure you actually gain something out of it and maybe you left your mark on it as well. Um, and then last, this is a bit nuanced, but it's important to show commitment and longevity to whatever extracurricular you pick. Try to stick with it, maybe two years, maybe three years. Try not to jump from extracurricular to extracurricular without a good reason because that sort of commitment is important to show a medical school that you're capable of. So with that being said, some examples of extracurriculars you can get involved in in each of these three categories are as follows. Um, when it comes to clinical um, extracurriculars, the most important thing I can stress here is shadowing. 
Um, we mentioned it before, but shadowing is where you email a physician, ask them if you can follow them around and see how they engage with their patients and what they do in their clinic on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe you do this one day a week or something like that. But what this does is it shows medical schools and it shows yourself for that matter that you understand what you're getting into. You understand the job that you wanna go into. Next for volunteering, you can volunteer at a hospital, at a soup kitchen, animal shelter, for example, there are clubs on campus that are philanthropic. And that means that you go out with, as part of the club and volunteer in your community. And then one example of something that I did, which I thought was really impactful was big brothers and big sisters, because this gives you the ability to interact one-on-one -on -one with one person in the community and actually make an impression on them. And then research. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with research. I know when I was in high school, it wasn't even on my radar. But research is essentially you email a professor at a college who's doing work in a specific field that you find interesting and you ask them if you can help out. Um, most universities or a lot of universities are big research centers and they love to have students on board helping them out. So getting involved in research, although it's really rewarding, can also be really intimidating initially. Um, so it's important to realize that there's other students like you who are out there trying to get involved and professors actually do want your guys' help. They like that enthusiasm and they're happy to have you on board. Um, research can be clinical. And what I mean by that is that means you can be working in a clinical setting with regards to patients and patient data, or it can be basic science. And that means you can be doing like lab bench work um, and wet lab stuff. Also, as part of research, if you can, it's always nice to present a research poster at a conference or something. And what I mean by that is that shows that maybe you took a project on and you did something significant in it and now you want to present it. Like, it's kind of like a science fair, just a little bit adult version of it. And then um, if you can, and this is obviously not critical at all to getting into medical school, but it's nice to publish if that opportunity presents so gap years. If the journey to medicine was a four course meal, I like to think of gap years as the optional soup course. It's an optional course between a college and applying. It's a completely personal decision and it just depends on if it fits right for you. Maybe if you have a little extra room in your stomach after your salad course. But reasons for taking a gap year, I just wanted to list out a few for you guys. Um, sometimes people take it to perform better academically. Say you had a rough go at it in college, maybe the last few years weren't, weren't your best. Maybe you want to take a, take some time to do a one year or two year master's to sort of bump up your GPA before you apply. You could also use it to explore other fields you're interested in. It's not wrong for you to get to the end of college and be like, I don't know, there's two or three things that I'm really interested in. I want to give this one a go before I go into medical school. Medical schools actually appreciate that more because they know that when you do start applying, you really want to go into medicine. You might use it to work and save up money because medical school can be expensive. You might wanna cultivate some soft skills. Um, medicine is, as much as it is a science field, it's also an interpersonal field where you're interacting with people all the time. So you might wanna improve communication skills, problem solving, adaptability, because you're working on a team all the time. Um, you might wanna gain a real world perspective. College can kind of be a bubble sometimes and you might wanna get out there and see what the real world has to offer. And lastly, and this is important, but sometimes you wanna take a gap year just to avoid academic burnout because school can be hard sometimes. And after four years of go, 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 go in college, sometimes you just need time to travel and spend time with family and take the time that you need before committing to medicine. And like I mentioned, medical schools wanna know that when you apply, you're hundred percent sure that this is the career path that you wanna take. So with that being said, I like to think of the medical school application as your main course meal. It's what you've been working up to this whole time, and it features a little sample of all of your favorite flavors and dishes from your pre-med years. Also, guys, if you have any questions throughout this, throw it in the chat. I'd be happy to answer them after the presentation or if we have a little bit of time throughout. So the medical school application, the best way I could think to explain this to you guys is to compare it to the college application. I'm not sure um, what point you guys are in in your high school experience, but if applications are coming up, then some of you might be more familiar with this. For college, generally, the application is a common app. For medical school, our equivalent of that is the AMCAS or the TMDSAS for Texas schools. Um, the entrance exam for college, you guys use the SAT or the ACT. We use the MCAT. Grades are the same. We need a GPA in the form of a transcript. Essay, generally a personal statement. Letters of recommendation extracurriculars like we talked about. And then in college, sometimes you have college specific essays depending on what college you're applying to. Medical school, after you submit your initial primary application, 
Sometimes schools will get back to you with additional school specific essays that they'd like to they'd like you to answer and resubmit. So that's what secondary essays are. And lastly, I wanted to cover the medical school application timeline. I know this is far out for you guys, and I don't want you to concern yourselves with it at all, but I just thought I'd provide some context for those of you who are interested. So around early May is when applications open. Late May is the earliest you can submit your application. July is when secondary applications are sent out usually. August through March are interviews where you fly out to the school, you tour the school, you meet some students, talk to faculty. And then October through May are what we call rolling admissions. And what rolling means is that they can accept you into their school at any point between October and May. And that's why we say it's important to submit your application and your secondaries early so that you can get back and maybe get acceptances earlier too. Finally, if the journey of medicine was a four course meal, your med medical school acceptance is that sweet, sweet dessert at the end. Welcome to the next chapter of your life. I hope you remember to enjoy your meal along the way because that's equally important to getting everything else done. But with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to Trevor and he's going to talk about life as a medical student. Great. Thank you so much, Magna. Uh, let me get my screen shared here. All right, so uh, thank you very much, Magna. That was a great presentation. Now that we are in medical school, I think that you have made it past the most difficult part, in my opinion. The application to get into medical school is a very long uh, and sometimes difficult process. Um, uh, not only have you just gone through four years of high school, four years of college, but the med uh, application process itself can take an entire year and it's uh, very exhausting. And then once you finally get that acceptance, it feels so good because you know that you're on the path to becoming a doctor. So now we're going to talk about what it's like going through the next four years of schooling uh, in medical school. So uh, before we get started, uh, just a brief introduction for me. My name is Trevor Smith. Uh, I went to high school at Paradise Valley. Uh, right here in Phoenix. I was born and raised, and then I graduated at ASU with a uh, major in biochemistry and a minor in community health. I took two gap years. I worked as a clinical research coordinator at Arizona Oncology. Uh, it was a great experience, and it really, really helped my application. Um, I'm not sure if I would have gotten in without it. Uh, you know, you, no matter how strong you have a college application, no matter how many extracurriculars you do, uh, a lot of med schools like to see some work experience and it's becoming much more normal to uh, get one or two gap years in there. And then finally, I'm just starting out. We're in our second semester now at UA Comp uh, Now going on to the first question that I have for you guys is when you think of medical school, words come to mind. You could just put them in chat, um, any word that you can when you think of medical school. No, study, study, study. You are not wrong. That is definitely one of the first things that come into mind. Challenging. Yes, it's very challenging. A lot of uh, schools can be challenging. Uh, college is challenging. And if you're not being challenged, then, uh, you know, you want to keep working at it. Rewarding, exciting. is great. Stressful. Yes, very stressful. Uh, these are great. Uh, you know, med school, everyone has a different um, idea of what medical school is, and everyone's going to have a different experience with it, too. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about what my experience is like and what some general experiences are. So first thing when it comes to medical school, you have to remember there's a lot of them. There's 154 MD programs across the U.S. and 38 DO programs. Uh, you can apply to many of these colleges, and you can also look at where you want to be geographically. You can see if you want to stay in-state. Um, some schools have preference for in-state students, uh, and other schools might be private, and they might accept people from all around the U.S. Um, these are things you have to keep in mind when you're looking at the application process. And when you go in for your interview, you can actually visit the school. And I really encourage you to walk around in the town and see if this is the place where you want to spend the next four years of your life. And then when you go to these schools, everyone's going to have a different curriculum, a different way of approaching uh, their teaching and their clinical rotations. Um, so these are all things that you want to make sure uh, that you keep in your mind. Uh, I just see a quick question, the difference between MD and DO. Uh, so MD uh, is the typical medical program um, and DO is the uh, doctor of osteotherapy, I believe. Um, but this is a uh, alternative to getting your normal MD uh, or you can go in um, to these different colleges. Uh, it used to be more um, 
there was a bigger difference and a gap between the two uh, where they would apply to different residencies. But now we're at the point where these DO programs are applying to the same residencies as an MD program. So you can actually uh, go into uh, different areas. And as Isabel said, allopathic versus osteopathic. So, um, that's something you can keep in mind. DO is definitely a great option for you if you want. So a way that you can learn a lot about the school is through their mission statement. Uh, University of Arizona, College of Medicine and Phoenix, this is their mission statement. It basically tells you what they're hoping to accomplish during your four years, what type of physicians they're type, uh, learning to, uh, trying to train, and also uh, what they hope to um, uh, bring to you as a school and make sure that you are getting the best opportunities possible during your time there. So you can see that U of A uh, really wants to focus on training physicians that are also scientists and leaders and are focusing not just on patient care, but optimizing health and healthcare in Arizona and beyond. So a very big public health focus. And they also um, are mentioning that being positioned in Phoenix, which is a very large community for both science and uh, medicine, you can see that there is going to be a very great opportunity for their students to be able to take advantage of the different uh, science, uh, research areas and hospitals that are around the valley. And you can make sure that you use these partnerships to uh, enhance your experience overall. So, and that's just their mission statement. There's also visions and all these different ways that they're going to let you know what the goal of their school is. And they really do try to stick with that. So the way that medical school is broken up is, uh, and how I think of it, is that there's the first two years, which are known as your preclinicals, and then you, the second two years are your clinicals. So uh, in preclinicals, years one and two, it's going to be a lot of schooling and a lot of lectures. And then in clinicals is when you're actually going to be out there and you're going to be spending a majority of your time uh, with doctors and in hospitals and working with them to actually see what it's like to work in a medical practice. So starting with year one, the way that UA splits up their curriculum is based on body systems. So the uh, first year you get a quick introduction to medicine, sort of like an orientation for two weeks where they tell you about what classes are gonna be like. And then you get into basic science and molecular science, a little refresher on biochemistry. And you're starting off with clinical anatomy. So that's uh, typically where you're going to do dissections or you're going to be learning about the different locations of all the body organs, all the way from your brain, to your feet, everything in between, it's gonna, you're gonna find out exactly where it's located. And then you, um, what we're learning about in the actual lectures is uh, all the different ins and outs of the um, parts of the body, such as the musculoskeletal system, the nervous system, the cardiac system, and the renal system. You basically become an expert on these specific areas of the body in four to six weeks. Uh, so for instance, right now we're in our cardiac system uh, block right now. So all we're learning about is the heart and blood and how it works and what can go wrong with it and how we can treat it. And then also we start out, uh, U of A is a little unique in that we start out right away with year one in doctoring. So we're going, um, I'm gonna speak a little bit more about that in the next few slides, but this basically means we're going to also be learning all the clinical skills that we need to perform physical exams and interact with patients, things that you're gonna be doing day to day as a physician. Year two, uh, you're going to continue that. Uh, you're going to uh, go focus on some other uh, body systems such as the GI system, reproductive system, endocrine, which is things like hormones. And then you also have some topics on oncology, which is cancer. And you also look at behavioral health, nutrition, so that you can get more of a full body approach when you're treating your patients. And you're gonna continue doctoring throughout year two. And then what the big thing that we're working towards is a test known as the USMLE Step 1. Uh, this is a test that's a very, it's a standardized test that you need to pass in order to progress uh, into years three and four and eventually graduate. Uh, it's essentially like the um, uh, SATs maybe, uh, these different uh, standardized tests that you have to take in order to get into residency, except you actually do need to pass it. It's become pass fail by the time that we're going to take it. It used to be scored like the MCAT or the ACT and the SAT, but now it's just pass fail. So now if you pass it, you're able to continue on with your education and be able to go on to years three and four and eventually graduate. Then in year three, we have uh, your first year of clinical rotation. So clinical rotations are where you're going to go to different hospitals and sites around the valley. And you're going to be working with a doctor or multiple doctors, nurses, the entire staff on uh, a, uh, some type of rotation within their field. You're actually going to be seeing patients. You're actually going to be treating patients. You're going to be um, working at, with the care team on documenting everything that you do. Uh, and you're going to become a part of their team for four to six weeks typically. 
Uh, these rotations start off with th general things like emergency medicine, family medicine, psychiatry, pediatrics, surgery rotations where you actually will be scrubbed in on surgeries and you may be asked to um, take part in the surgeries. And then uh, internal medicine, uh, neurology, which is working with the brain. And you're still getting tested during this time. So when you're doing that rotation, by the end of the rotation, you get what's known as a shelf exam, where you're going to get tested on uh, the specifics of that field. And then year four, uh, a lot of the same of year three, except there's even more that you can go into. And at this point, you're going to be wanting, you, you're allowed to actually decide what you want to rotate into and what you want to focus on. Because by the end of year four and throughout year four, you're applying to your residency programs and residencies are gonna be talked about a little bit more with Isabel, but that is essentially where you're going to be starting out uh, your training in some type of specialty and where you're most likely going to be working for a good portion of your life. So you are able to have the freedom to uh, shadow all these different fields and you can decide whether or not it's right for you. And uh, hopefully you find that one that's a good fit for you. Almost everyone finds one that they fall in love with and it may not be something that you uh, are thinking of at first. You might go into medical school thinking, I'm never gonna do surgery. I, I don't like it, I can't stand it. I can't stand the sight of blood. And then eventually you get to your surgery rotation and you fall in love with it. And then when you get to year four, you're gonna do a couple of other surgery rotations and decide if you wanna go into orthopedic surgery or anything like that. Um, now, uh, going on from that, it's not all just schools in years one and two where uh, have those other classes known as doctoring. So doctoring is where I mentioned you're going to actually take care of uh, patients, except they're not real patients. We hire actors to act as patients. Uh, and they are given some type of disease or condition that they're going to, that we work through. Um, those of you that participate in Saturday Scrubs, it's very similar to that. Uh, somebody presents with some type of complaint or some type of injury, and you are going to question them and ask them all the questions and get all the information that you need. And then you're going to go into a physical exam uh, and make sure that you are able to locate exactly where the issue is and give them a diagnosis, a treatment, and you're documenting all of this as you go. Case-based instruction is very similar. Um, it's not as hands-on. You're working with a small group, and that's really focusing on learning how to think like a doctor. So you're given very complicated case, uh, case presentations, and you have a uh, physician that you're working with at, in a small group of six people, and you're going to talk about the different symptoms and presentations and come up with a differential diagnosis. So what you think it might be, and there can be three or four differential diagnoses, and you talk about tests that you want to gather and you work through it. And eventually by the end, your, your group comes up with a diagnosis, a treatment, and you talk about what the overall purpose of this was. And then finally, there's community clinical experiences, which are really cool. So you get to continue your shadowing, essentially, and you're working with primary care physicians. So primary care physicians are what you would go see with your family, maybe while you're going up or still go see if there's any kind of just general checkup or physical that you need. These are people that are working in our community, and you get to go see them um, once every two weeks, and you shadow them, and you work with them and see how an actual clinic is run. Um, very, very great uh, uh, opportunity for everyone. Uh, and then, of course, to keep things safe and make sure that we are not, um, uh, make sure that we are safe, the students are safe, and the community is safe during COVID, all of these have been converted to Zoom for our class, which I'm sure everyone in high school can relate with. Um, everyone's dealing with Zoom right now. And so uh, it's still a great experience. We still get to work with patients. We still get doctoring. We still get case-based instruction. And we're still doing our CCE where we're talking about different cases with these primary care physicians. Fortunately, this um, will not be the case for much longer. A lot of our class is vaccinated and we are going to be returning to in-person um, in the next couple of months to actually do those physical exams and get some more hands-on experience. And then of course, it's not just schools, you get to continue your volunteering. Volunteering never stops, doesn't matter if you're in high school, college, med school, beyond, you always wanna volunteer because it's, it's a great thing to do and it's a great way to build yourself as a person and to give back to the community. Um, one of the big things that the school has are what's known as interest groups. Uh, these are kind of like clubs that you are, um, might be more familiar with and they're focused mainly on different um, specialties. 
in medicine, or they can be focused on different aspects of medical uh, care that you might want to um, talk more about. So things such as the American Medical Women's Association, or you can do a specialty like interventional radiology or neurosurgery. And those are where you're going to ask physicians in that field, come and speak with you and, um, and your group. And you can learn more about that specialty and talk about why you're interested in it. We have a uh, community clinic that you volunteer at, and these are where you're actually going to be giving um, uh, physical exams and gathering information from uh, um, uh, members of your community and patients. Uh, it's a free clinic right now. It's a telemedicine only, but again, that might be returning to in-person. It's known as Wesley. And you're going to want to continue research throughout medical school. Again, it's not a requirement, but it is something that's really great. Um, you, we have a great connection with the Barrow Neurological Institute here at UA. Uh, and we also have things called scholarly projects. So UA actually has a requirement that you need to do at least one research project from beginning to end within your four years. And they help you throughout that entire process and get you connected to research uh, if you haven't already. And then there's a lot of volunteer programs I could spend uh, this entire presentation talking about how many volunteer programs we have. But of course, since this is a Saturday Scrubs event, I'm going to talk about Saturday Scrubs. It's a great time that we do uh, once a month where we uh, work with uh, people in high school and walk through cases just like we do in doctoring or CBI. And uh, uh, it's really great. You should check it out if you haven't. We're going to have a slide at the end where you can look at the signups for that. So what it all looks like at the end is this big scary slide that shows all four years here. Uh, we make sure that we um, are uh, keeping up on everything throughout this time. Uh, it looks scary, but it's really not that bad. So I'm gonna go on to what my actual first uh, life is like as a medical student. So first of all, they give you a suggestion schedule. If you're not familiar with something like this, uh, the, this is something that you'll get familiar with in college. It, it shows you what your classes are from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And as you can see, we have some of our required courses on there like doctoring or CBI. And then uh, you also have some homework classes. So these are gonna be videos or PowerPoints that you wanna review. There's live lectures, but not all of them are mandatory. And even though these classes end at 12 o'clock here, your day's not over. And it's really up to you to make sure that you are um, following your own routine and your own schedule and keeping up on your studies. So what that requires is self-guided learning. So I like the phrase, study like it's your job. You should be studying at least eight hours a day. And whether that's being part in doctoring or going to lectures or just studying on your own, you need to make sure that you're studying at least eight hours a day and you need to keep up on topics that you've already learned about. It's not uh, once you take the test on something, you can't just forget about it because you also have step one that you need to know it for. You need to know it for clinicals and you're also going to need to know it for your job eventually. So you want to make sure that you refresh yourself on those topics. Flashcards are a great way to do that. Question banks are a great way to do that or just reviewing the content all over again. Keeps it fresh in your mind and it makes it harder to forget. So how are you going to do this? It's a lot to manage, I know, but the biggest issue is, or the biggest thing to do is just don't panic. Everything is going to be fine. Lots of medical students struggle with it at the beginning, but everyone, uh, almost everyone succeeds in it. Uh, and it's a, a very long process, but there's lots of help out there. I like the phrase, resources are your friends and your friends are your resources. These are just a few of the outside resources that you can use. Um, and there's also uh, resources inside the school that you can use. Uh, our school offers uh, tutoring for free, offers counseling if you're struggling with things outside of schooling. Uh, there's also your friends that you can talk to and they can help you with anything because if anyone knows what you're going through, uh, it's your friends. And this is also a pass fail um, uh, medical school. So you don't have to worry about competition among your classmates. You can make sure that you really collaborate with them and work with them and whenever you're going through it. And then some of the other resources, AMBOSS, Anki, Boards and Beyond, you don't need to worry about these, but when you become a med student, you're going to become very familiar with them. So here's what my ideal day is. Uh, I say ideal because this is a day that probably I don't very often, but if I'm going to have a great day with studying, a great day with school, here's what it looked like. I wake up at 7.30, I shower, coffee, breakfast. I'm gonna review yesterday's classes for the first four hours, or I'm gonna look at a mandatory class. Then from 12 to one, you wanna make sure that you take a break, you can eat. Those those lunch talks that I mentioned with interest groups that are with physicians and faculty. And then from one to five, you're gonna to wanna to learn about some of the new content, or you can uh, use those outside resources. And then on Wednesdays, we have doctoring. So we go to that from one to five. And then five to seven, I like to take a nice little break uh, for a couple hours, make some dinner, walk, catch up on my Netflix shows, talk to friends, uh, meal prep if it's the beginning of the week. 
And then after that, it's kind of up to you. Um, you can figure out what you need to finish up for assignments, review what tomorrow's schedule is going to be like. And if you have time, it's always good to review some additional concepts. And then after that, you need at least an hour to unwind, uh, play some video games, do whatever you need to relax and get ready for bed. And then finally, uh, eight and a half hours of sleep, that would be amazing. I don't think I must get eight and a half hours of sleep, but, but if you can, sleep is so important. It's all about building those healthy habits. So some of the key points I just want you to remember, I remember don't worry about any of this right now. Uh, med school is a long way away. And as Magda mentioned, you should really focus on growing as a person and building those habits. If you can get eight hours of sleep, keep getting eight hours of sleep. And if you make it through the application process, like I said, you probably have what it takes to succeed in med school. Um, you made it through college. They thought you were good enough. You made it a grueling uh, application process. And now you're here and they want you to succeed and they'll give you all the resources. So that's what the next point is. They want you to succeed. It's an endless amount of resources and never be afraid to ask for help. This is just good life advice in general. If you need help with anything, um, everyone needs help. Everyone's going to struggle with it at some point and you can ask for help and they'll help you out there. And then finally, medical school is fun. It's so much fun. You're gonna be working in a field that you love. You're gonna be making lifelong friends at this point. Eventually you're going to be a doctor. So that's my presentation. I'm going to pass it off now to Isabel. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Trevor. I will share my screen and then talk to you guys a little bit about um, what life is like as a physician. Okay, so you have made it through your four years of medical school. What happens now? Um, so again, I'll be talking to you guys about life as a doctor. And before I go into that, I wanted to briefly introduce myself. Um, my name is Isabel. I am also from Phoenix. I was born and raised here. I went to high school at Xavier College Prep and I graduated in 2015. For college, I went to Arizona State University. I studied biological sciences and psychology and I graduated in 2019. I also took a gap year. Um, I did a lot of research in college but felt like I wanted to get some more clinical experience. So I ended up getting hired on as a scribe in the emergency room at St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center in downtown Phoenix. And then I uh, am now here. So after that gap year, I also used that time to um, work on my application to medical school. I went and I interviewed, and now I am also a first year student um, at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix. So um, Trevor just spent a, a little bit of time talking to us about the journey through medical school, what your preclinical years look like, what your clinical years look like. And so now I'll be focusing on that year four and what comes after that. So um, after your four years of medical school, you get to choose the area of medicine that interests you most to further specialize and do more training in. So during your fourth year, you'll be applying to what's called a residency program. And residency program is that specific program dedicated to the area of medicine that you choose to specialize in. There are residency programs all over the country. A lot of fourth years will do what are called away rotations where they'll go and travel at certain travel to certain residency programs um, so that they can get a feel for what the place is like. And then after you've applied to all of these residency programs, you will have a match. So you get to rank your top residency programs. And then the residency programs that you interviewed at will also rank you and the perfect match comes along. And what happens is there's this national day where all of the fourth year medical students across the country get to um, basically expose their match and figure out where they'll be spending their residency. And this is called match day. Um, all residency programs last between three and seven years. And then for some specialties, you can even specialize further after that. And that's called fellowships. So a lot of people that go into more specialized areas like neurosurgery or cardiovascular surgery, which is surgery on the brain and the heart respectively, um, will do more research and more training to um, more specifically hone in their skills. So I wanted to show you guys a video of a match day celebration and what that typically looks like at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix. It's a really exciting day. Um, you know, you've been working so hard, not only just the past four years of medical school, but really all throughout college as well to get to this point where you're officially welcomed in to the community as a physician, you have your MD um, and you get to move on to the next chapter of your life.
Lots of happy tears. Everyone's just really excited to finally be moving on to this next phase of life. Obviously, you guys can see with 2020 that they had to do match day remotely, but people still found really awesome ways to celebrate with their loved ones and make it a special occasion. So, oops, <laughs> don't want to play again. <laughs> okay, so um, now that I've talked to you guys a little bit about, um, oops, talked to you a little bit about what it looks like to specialize in a certain area and what residency look like, looks like. Um, I would love to hear some specialties that you guys might wanna go into. So you can go into something like cardiology and cardiothoracic surgery, which is where you learn more about the heart. Emergency medicine, which is where you're presented with um, kind of like life or death situations and you have to basically save lives right on the bat. You can go into psychiatry if you're interested in mental health and the brain radiology if you like bones and are interested in looking at images, um, or any other specialty that's not on here that you guys would like to go into. I'd love to hear um, in the chat what you think. So it looks like we have one internal medicine, which is great. Immunology, orthopedic surgery, oncology, these are great. So yeah, that's the cool thing about getting to choose your specialty, right? Is that you really get to personalize what you'll be doing with your career even more um, and make it something that you're really passionate about. Most specialties are split into either primary care versus non-primary care. So primary care specialties are things like family medicine, emergency medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, where you learn more broadly just about the human body. You get to establish a very longitudinal relationship with patients who will come to your practice and see you over and over again. Um, and basically you're helping them with their long-term health. Whereas something like neurology or cardiology, you typically see patients on a more short-term basis and help them with one specific system um, of their body. And the other cool thing is that all of these specialties kind of overlap. So you can work with people in different specialties to help your patients establish really great overall health. So after a residency, which again lasts between three and seven years, depending on what you specialize in, you get to begin practice. And this means basically you have finally been welcomed into the community as an independently practicing physician. And at this point you're called an attending physician. <laughs> So you can go into private practice, which is where you basically own your own practice or work with other physicians in a more private sector. Um, you have your own patients, you can set your own schedule. You basically determine what your practice looks like. You can also work in a hospital setting. <clears throat> Here you would work for a hospital. You would work alongside, again, a lot of different specialties. Um, for example, if you're in emergency medicine, 
you um, will work in an emergency setting, and then you can consult other uh, areas, other specialties within the hospital um, to basically get a really great picture about what's going on with your patient and help them feel better. You can also work in public health, um, which is very pertinent right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of physicians that work in public health are working to promote um, things like mask wearing and social distancing, um, which again are great public health strategies to help maximize the health of all of our communities um, that live where we do. You can also go into academia. So if you're really passionate about mentorship and teaching, you can um, basically teach or help uh, raise other medical students or even college students to get or to help them along their journeys and get them to fulfill the goals that they have in their careers in medicine. So a lot of the faculty that teach us as current medical students are physicians that have decided to pursue academia. And then finally, you could also go into something like global or rural medicine. So a lot of physicians will choose to either work in rural areas where some of the communities might not have access to a lot of the resources that more urban or city living areas do, or they'll spend a lot of time volunteering in global areas. And this means traveling to foreign places to, again, bring medical resources to communities that might not have it typically. And it's not limited to this. You could practice really anywhere that pleases you and best suits you, but these are some of the main areas. So I have another question for you guys and you can throw in the chat what you think, but do doctors only practice medicine or can they do other things? Yeah, I see a couple other things and you guys are absolutely correct. So again, this comes down to specializing it just basically based on what you like doing. So a lot of <clears throat> a lot of physicians will get involved in research. Again, some specialties um, are more suitable for this than others. A lot of specialties like neurosurgery, um, which again, a little bit more specialized are really reliant on research, but the relationship between research and medicine go hand in hand. So medicine informs what things we need to uh, do research on, but then our findings and research also inform what we're able to do in clinical practice. A lot of physicians will also do consulting and a lot of these people are really interested in the overlap between business and medicine. And so what they'll do is they'll actually give their advice based on their experience in their clinical practice um, to inform businesses, inform, inform um, certain pharmacies, to basically give, get them a better idea about what's needed um, for the uh, greater well-being and for public health. Another thing you could do is advocacy. So again, if you're interested in public health or interested in law, you can work with legal firms, you can work with other agencies to advocate for patients. Um, a lot of this comes down to healthcare and making sure that patients um, really have the resources they need to achieve overall health. But advocating for your patients, whether you elect to go into specific advocacy or not, is really important um, part of being a physician and making sure that you're being there for your patients. You can also continue volunteering. So I know we talked a lot about volunteering in high school, in college, and in medical school. But if service work is something you're really passionate about, you can continue this throughout your practice and throughout the rest of your life. And then finally, I touched on this already a little bit, but teaching. So this doesn't necessarily have to be teaching medical students, but you can mentor really anyone to help them achieve their goals. And it's another really rewarding way that a lot of physicians spend their time. So something um, that a lot of physicians talk about is this idea of work-life balance, right? Your career as a physician is really important. Um, you've chosen this path because you're passionate about it and you're excited to make a difference, but there's other things in life that are important outside of just your career as a physician. And the important thing is that this looks different for everyone. So again, making it particular to what suits you best. So you can you know, spend a lot of time in clinical practice, you could spend more time in research, you could do volunteering, but you could also do art or music if that's something that you love doing. Um, you could spend a lot of time with your family if you have a family and want to prioritize that. Uh, if you're interested in sports or reading or Netflix or any other thing that uh, you're most passionate about, um, you can really decide how much time you want to spend in each area to create the life that you love 
and the life that's um, best suited to you. But again, no matter what, the key here is that you stay true to yourself. Um, I know we are running a little bit short on time and I want to make sure that we give you guys the opportunity to ask questions. We'll go back and answer for our Facebook Live folks some of the questions that have already been asked in the chat. So I am gonna skip this video that uh, just asks a few physicians basically about what life is like as a doctor. And just to sum it up, basically, um, everyone in this video talks about how rewarding and fulfilling it is, how much empathy you have to have, how dedicated they are to their physicians or to their patients. Um, and a lot of times, uh, or not a lot of times, but a lot of these physicians have a hard time coming up with um, what, you know, one word to sum this up. And that really, I think, is just reflective of the fact that um, it's such a rewarding path that it's hard to find one word to describe it. So what do other, or who do other physicians work with? So again, if you're on the wards, if you are in a hospital or a private practice, you'll work a lot of the times with other doctors or surgeons. You'll work, work with other scientists and researchers. You can work with business people, again, in that consulting area. There are also a lot of, lot of other specialties or a lot of other paths within this um, healthcare umbrella that uh, people will go into outside of being a doctor. So, um, you know, people will decide to become physician assistants, nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists. There are a lot of other areas, but the key here is that medicine is really, and healthcare is really a team-based field. So, you know, if you decide to go into medicine, great. If you decide to become a doctor, that's fantastic. We want you guys, we need more physicians. Um, but you could also go into any of these other areas. And if you're passionate about health, if you're passionate about healthcare, you can still have an influence um, and become a physician assistant or a nurse or a pharmacist and still work with physicians to um, exert your impact um, on public health and on your patients. So we talked about a lot today. I know it's a lot of information. Um, this was not meant to be uh, information overload, but I know that big picture can be a little bit scary. So we just wanted to give you an overview of what it all looks like put together. So you start off with high school, which is where you guys are at now, as well as college, where you prepare to get into medical school. Then you'll go into medical school where you can prepare to get into residency. Then you'll go into your internship, which is your first year of residency, and then your, few, uh, your subsequent years of residency and then fellowship. And then finally, you've made it. You're an attending position where you get to enjoy a fulfilling career, saving lives and aspiring to whatever goals you have. And the main thing here, again, we touched on this a lot, but you are going to work so hard. Um, this is a very difficult path, but it's also a very rewarding path. You know, if you make it this far and you're this passionate about it, it's really just the most fulfilling thing. I think myself, along with Megna and Trevor and our other classmates, um, will attest to this. You know, sometimes they're hard just because you are studying and working so hard and it's a big challenge for sure, but it's also very rewarding. And the biggest thing is that you should have fun. Um, if this is something that you really love doing, make it what you will, have fun, make friends along the way, get involved in research or volunteering or whatever else um, you really, really love doing and that will make the experience well worthwhile. So um, another quick plug, I know Trevor already talked about this, but if you liked this presentation and liked learning about what it's like to become a doctor and would want to learn a little bit more about what it might actually feel like to be a doctor, you can check out Saturday Scrubs. <clears throat> Again, Trevor, Magna, and I, along with Chip, um, who's on the call here, are the leaders of Saturday Scrubs. And you can also apply to Summer Scrubs, which is a continuation of Saturday Scrubs that happens during the summer, where you get a little bit more experience um, as to what it's like to be a doctor. And so the links to these are here. Um, I think if Maynard or Trevor wanted to share those in the chat with you guys, um, that way you can uh, explore a little bit more online and apply if you're interested. Um, we would love to have you. So um, again, it looks like we still have about five minutes for questions. Um, we can go back over and reread some of the questions that um, came up. That way our Facebook Live folks can have a chance to um, hear a little bit more insight. But uh, Maynard or Trevor, do either of you wanna take one of the first questions that came up? And feel free to send more questions in the chat as well. Sure. 
or we can just go ahead and switch off. Um, sorry, just give me a second to scroll back. Okay, what's the difference between MD and DO? We did cover that. Um, just a quick, quick summary of that. DO means doctor of osteopathic medicine. MD means doctor of allopathic medicine. An allopathic approach generally focuses on contemporary research-based medicine, and it often uses medi um, medications or surgery to treat and manage different conditions. Osteopathic approach to care focuses on the whole body and mind. They use more physical manipulation approaches, and they often focus a lot more on preventative care, um, which MDs focus on too. It's just a different approach to medicine generally, but like Trevor mentioned, the residencies are merging. So in general, they're becoming um, a lot more unified as fields of medicine. Um, Trevor, do you want to handle the difference between COMP-P and COMP-T? Yeah, for sure. So um, COMP-P is College of Medicine Phoenix and COMP-T is College of Medicine Tucson. So uh, there is a medical school also uh, through U UA down in Tucson. That's also where the main campus is. Um, of course, we do have the UA name, but we're actually not that uh, affiliated with the UA COMP-T down in Tucson. Uh, we are a separate medical school with uh, different um, leaders, different uh, uh, direction with our studies. Um, it, it, we have a class of 120, and I think COMT is 50, if I believe, if that's correct. Um, and of course, we are here up in Phoenix. They're down there in uh, Tucson. We are both MD programs, so uh, there's no difference there, but um, they are two completely separate medical schools with different requirements as well. So if you're going to be applying to one, you need to make sure that you're not um, just doing the same exact thing for both ones. They're uh, two different applications. Also, just to tack on to that really quick, um, University of Arizona College of Medicine Phoenix is generally for graduate students. We have nursing, physical therapy, and medical school programs. Um, College of Medicine in Tucson is the medical school, but it's also located on the same campus as their undergraduate campus. Um, and yeah, I, I do believe COMT also has about 120 people in their class size as well. There's also a great question here about um, wanting to know if you can shadow even if you're in high school. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Shadowing is a great way to start to figure out whether you're interested in medicine and might want to go into healthcare. And lots of physicians in the community are willing to let both high school and college students shadow them. So if you're considering it, I would highly recommend just as a way to kind of get an idea about whether you might want to go into medicine. There's one question that came in, uh, what do physician assistants do? Uh, so this is another option if you wanted to practice in medicine uh, to some degree. Uh, physician assistant is a two-year program compared to medical school four-year program uh, that you'll still be working in a clinic or sometimes even in an operating room uh, to assist with surgeries. Um, they are uh, have a lot of the similar functions as a doctor. They just don't have as much of the um, uh, as much responsibility, but they still are a really vital uh, part of the team um, in helping with uh, doctors and physicians running their clinic. And then I guess to wrap it up, we have one question about what happens if you fail medical school? Um, we just wanna mention that medical schools really care about making sure that everyone does well and no one fails. I think that was kind of reiterated throughout all of our presentations that they really do care and they want you to pass and do well. Um, often schools, like if you don't pass a test, for example, because that happens to everyone, if you don't pass a test, most schools have an opportunity to let you retake an exam or even if you don't pass a block, sometimes there's opportunities for that as well. So don't worry about that too much. Well, we're starting to run out of time for this session, but thank you all so much. And I just have to say how inspiring you all are, um, particularly during this time of COVID, um, such great information. I also want to acknowledge and do a shout out to Chip Young, who's joined us, who also helps oversee uh, the Scrubs programs for the University of Arizona College of Medicine up here in Phoenix, who does a wonderful job um, of working with this and putting this all together. So. Thank you so much. And I just have to say on behalf of everyone, we wish you all the best um, in the years to come. And um, 
hopefully we will be able to see you someday um, as a physician. So we look forward to that. And that match day video is always um, so inspiring. Um, I think all of us have a little tear in our eye when we watch it. So good luck to you all. And I also want to say congratulations to our t-shirt winner for this session, who is Monique R. Um, thank you for that. Yes, congratulations. We've got our turquoise shirts going today. Um, also, um, Anne-Marie has dropped uh, the survey um, in the chat function. If you wouldn't mind, please uh, clicking on that and taking just a few seconds, uh, just a few questions to give us some feedback. We'd like to see how we're doing for our Connect to STEM programs. And now I encourage you to stay with us because we have lots more fun and STEM excitement coming your way in just a moment. Wasn't that fun? You did great. Do me a favor. Before the end of the day today, tell a friend or grown-up something you learned today. Be sure to check back for more Connect to STEM TV. There's lots more cool videos to check out. You know what? I should invite my friends to join the next session so we can work together virtually. Don't forget you need to register here. Special thanks to our sponsors, Banner Health APS, for their great support. For more nerdy ideas, follow Connect to STEM on Facebook. And here are some important reminders. Be kind, wash your hands, and mask up.